Hello, and welcome to The Two View, the cutting-edge educational show for PAs and nurse practitioners in emergency medicine and urgent care. My name is Mike Sharma. I'm a practicing emergency medicine and urgent care PA in the Dallas, Texas area, and an adjunct professor of PA studies. With me, as always, is Martha Roberts. Martha, hello. Hi there, Mike. I'm Martha Roberts, and I'm emergency medicine NP in Northern California. Well, it's a very special time of the year in the Sharma household. That's right. Happy spring break to those of you who observe. It's been great having my girl Geeka home, my big girl from college. We got to eat some soup dumplings, finally watch that movie, The Marvels. Uh, we even engaged in some uh, board game battles. It's just so rewarding to watch your grown child be absolutely ruthless at board games. It's times like those that you realize that you, you raised them right. You know, uh, hey, by the time you can hear this on this, I'll have just gotten back from the Emerge NP, the American Academy of Emergency Nurse Practitioners Annual Conference. I got to give a bunch of classes on EKG interpretation, which we'll talk about later on today, and a class on why someone who has chronic joint pain may still be an emergency department problem. So thank you to Salt Lake City, and thank you for AANP for having me back. Martha, how about you? Do you have any big uh, spring break plans? Wow, I can't really compete with any of that. I have zero plans except to work and finish this textbook that I have on my desk here. So a lot of editing. And a lot of work, and hopefully maybe a weekend in Tahoe. We'll see. But oh, that's that's plans. And by what, what textbook might that be, Martha? This is Clinical Procedures and Emergency Medicine, Robertson Hedges, and we are slowly but fiercely finishing the eighth edition. Uh, slow but fierce is my middle. Th second through fourth names, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Okay, very good. Tahoe sounds fun. Have you been before? Yes, it's a beautiful lake, and the water is incredible. I recommend it. Highly recommend. Nice. 10 out of 10. Okay. A plus would, would buy again. Very good. Okay. Today, we are going to talk a bit about cough and post-infectious cough, <laughs> TB and latent <clears throat> TB. There you go. Thanks for the... Uh, they're nice. And end with some incidental findings cases, including a few thoughts on real masses, skin findings, and, and just how incidental findings have touched uh, at least my life uh, very directly. All right, so let's dive right in. Actually, all that coughing made me have a little bit of a worse voice. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> but what I found is after this first segment is I still wanted to know more, even after all the researching I did. But let's talk about it. Let's start with tuberculosis. We're going to talk a little bit about just cough in general, but I think that this is an interesting little piece of information for us. Um, so beginning here talking about post-infectious cough. And we all know that flu, RSV, COVID, and all these other respiratory illnesses can be accompanied with a cough. Oftentimes, the cough is short-lived with a residual tickle. It might last up to a week or two, maybe worse at night as it, as it gets better. But these post-infectious coughs, um, when they're lasting a lot longer, you know, three to eight weeks after the initial infection can be very troublesome. And you will find, if you haven't already, patients are coming in saying, I've had a cough for multiple weeks. Right. So there are a couple of immediate things that I want our listeners to take into account when dealing with a post-infectious cough. So super infections or double infections are frequent, especially in our young population, and especially in our large populations of homeless or those with other social determinants of health. Usually, getting a good history and timeline of their infection and determining uh, their symptoms really, how how terrible they are on their on the scale here of symptoms is really important. Um, it also will help you determine if they have gotten sick again with something new or if this is a post-infectious cough. The other thing I want people to consider is that anybody who smokes anything, whether it's an e-cigarette, marijuana, whatever, they're going to have a prolonged cough. That's it. You know, that's that's it. Those are the facts. Those are that's going to happen. If you're a smoker, your cough is going to last longer. So don't just count the fact that anybody who inhales anything into their lungs may have an increased state of inflammation in their body, poor functioning alveoli, lung function, etc. And if they're older, they're even more likely to have things like COPD or emphysema. So this post-infectious cough may be certainly related to their initial infection, but is it COPD? Is it emphysema? Is it overall just poor lung health? And remember that these patients who use these cigarettes, there's chemicals in there, especially this vitamin, vitamin E supplement that they mm. put, really bad. And uh, that can mm. cause those e-cigarette uh, vaping associated lung injuries, especially in our young patients. Just had one, 19-year-old female. No kidding. Yeah. Just I feel like it went away um, when COVID happened. Like We probably just quit caring about it, honestly. But 
But you saw that, huh? Absolutely. So she came in and she had a really severe post kind of infectious cough and she was feeling a lot better. So she decided to smoke, quote, an entire bar. And an entire bar is one of those uh, nicotine, like... uh, they're like a little, some of them are made by a company called Elf. It's just straight up nicotine. They're supposed to last two to three weeks. She smoked the whole <laughs> bar in one day, and she really had good. a pretty significant lung injury. So lastly, I kind of want to just have you think about and not discount the possibility of pertussis. Mm. Okay, we're going to talk about tuberculosis a little bit later, but don't discount Pertussis is making a comeback like giant hair bows and ponytails. Apparently that's in right now. (laughs) So patients definitely should consider um, this diagnosis in them when they have a whooping-like cough, cough that has vomiting. The cough is persistent to two to three weeks. And the CDC says that a PCR is a rapid test, but the test that has optimal sensitivity after three weeks of cough, when bacterial DNA is still present in the nasopharynx, that's when you should be using that. PCR test. Around the fourth week of the cough or later, it rapidly diminishes and it can have a lot of false negative results. So gold standard, guys, 100% specificity is a culture. That can sometimes take three, it can take three to seven days to result. But since it has excellent specificity, it is particularly useful in getting uh, the diagnosis. So uh, honestly, that's usually what I get. You might want to get both. That's fine. I put a link in the CDC notes uh, above in our show notes. You can take a look at what the CDC suggests. It also has this really wonderful video of how to actually obtain one of these cultures. And basically, you put the swab in the nose, hit the brain, take it out. Mike, take a look at that. How much chance. brain tissue is required to be on the swab for it to be a valid culture? Do you did it specify how much is it nanograms of brain tissue, micrograms, actual grams? Ninety eight percent of the brain. So. Oh wow. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> I, <laughs> the, the, so the I good kid. news is it's not it's not to, pertussis. The bad news is you are yeah you've, you've we've reduced your education level to a first grader. Yeah, and sorry about that. So the links of the nice graph are in there. Whether to do a culture or PCR, for, the CDC has a really great page. Serology or blood testing can also be used. The treatment of choice, of course, is erythromycin, clarithromycin, or azithromycin, and that is in anybody over one month of age. For any um, kiddo that has this and they're super young, that's a different show and a different podcast for today. Mm. So l- uh, very last thing, last thing, Mike, chest X-ray may be a value, okay? Chest X-ray can be good. I like it. Um, but I'm just going to leave it at that. You make your decision. When in doubt, you can do some corticosteroids, albuterol, or even some ero- uh, oral steroids. They might have some value, but the literature is mixed. Okay, for my wet read segment, uh, I'm going to talk about this. If you've worked in the ED long enough, this has happened to you. You could be daydreaming, drinking, eating, even mid-sentence conversation when, like the Spanish Inquisition, somebody appears out of nowhere with an EKG and thrusts it in front of you. And you've got to decide, is this person who uh, the EKG belongs to having an occlusive MI, also known as a STEMI or STEMI equivalent, or not? On top of this being another distraction in a department full of distractions. This potentially life or death decision may feel very scary for you to make if you're the one having to make it. Maybe it'll reassure you to know that a prospective single center study of almost 2,300 EKGs published in the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine in January 2024 suggested that despite everything we've heard about, you know, computer misreads of EKGs, a computer read of normal or otherwise normal on an EKG can rule out With 100% certainty, the presence of occlusive MI or need for emergent cardiac catheterization. Nice. But here's why I'm not convinced. There's always a but. Sometimes it's a big but, sometimes it's small, but there's always a but. The gold standard that the machine interpretation of the EKG was compared to was a cardiologist's opinion. Cardiologists, we love you, but a 2019 prospective multicenter study pretty big, suggests that even cardiologists are only 49% sensitive at diagnosing occlusive MI on EKG interpretation. If we are really going to say the computer read normal or otherwise normal EKGs are not missing occlusive MIs, we need to compare that standard 
to the gold standard, which truly is a heart cath, which I know that's extraordinarily invasive, but if we're to be making these big sweeping statements of, yes, the EKG machine is 100% sensitive, then we need to kind of like, you know, break a few eggs to make the omelet, so to speak. We need to kind of like put folks, you know, uh, through this ringer for the betterment of the science, if we're really going to claim this, in my opinion. Uh, links to these studies and to the things that Martha mentioned about uh, pertussis uh, can be available on our website. That is twoview.fireside.fm. That's the number, twoview.fireside.fm. Martha, do you recall how you learned to read EKG so well back in the day? What was your process? Well, as a nurse, you know, as a bedside nurse in the early uh, 2000s, I saw hundreds of EKGs. I was in triage mm. a lot, and I kept a nice collection. And as I became more experienced, I would review them, little tidbits here and there. My father taught me a lot, which was really great. He was a pro. Um, and, you know, who else is Diane Birnbaumer? So mm. I thank her for that. One of the big things is when I was in nurse practitioner school as well, we had to learn those at Georgetown. It was a big deal. And we couldn't graduate without the proper EKG test of interpretation. So, yeah, lots of training, and I'm still learning, and I very much enjoy looking at them anytime. I think it's really good that you had that rigorous education. Um, I, I teach EKG interpretation at, at many schools, and I, I don't think I go easy on people. I teach them very well, and so they do a good job when they pass. They do well in my courses, but I'm not sugarcoating it nor do I downplay the importance of EKG intervention skill. I'm really worried about some practitioners that are getting out right now, especially those who are, are going into full practice and states, and they've got to pay on their own dime to learn things like suturing or EKG interpretation. And and yet their, you know, their their state leadership or their national leader says, yes, we should have, you know, full practice authority. Like that there just seems like it'd be a disconnect there. I don't understand it. I think we're going to solve a lot of these issues over the next two decades. I really do. And <laughs> uh, I, I mean it. I mean, there's just so much tension that is put on these issues. Like, we can't ignore them any longer. And I've already seen a few changes. Um, you know, so I'm hopeful. I, I usually am not hopeful, but today I am. T you know? Today's a day of hope. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> Well, listen, the good news for you listening, like whether or not you got a good education in EKGs, uh, uh, you know, in the end, the the science is always moving forward. And so even if you're educated well five years ago, things have happened since then, okay? New findings have come out. And, and the good news, if you're listening to this, you have all the tools you need to become a true expert in emergency EKG interpretation. You've got an education baseline and a willingness to take it further. Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening to us. So you've got everything you need. All you have to do is, is get after it and, and start looking at more EKGs and reading more. Speaking of EKG interpretation, I am still just so excited to be delivering with Fred Abrahamian, uh, MD, the EKG interpretation workshop at the Center for Medical Education's Advanced Emergency Medicine Boot Camp. We took a year off, folks, but now we are back and we are better than ever. July 9th is our pre-course day for this EKG workshop, and we'll have an imaging workshop as well. And our main advanced boot camp course will be July 10 through 12th. You know the deal. Everybody wants to be on vacation in the summer, and it can be hard for your department or your, your urgent care clinic to get some time off. So you better ask the boss now. A quick text. Uh, don't be texting and driving. You know, maybe voice a text, something. I don't know. There's a little something to the boss saying, hey, I really want to up my emergency medicine game. I know it's not yet time for July schedule requests, but I got to be off July 9th through 12th so I can go to the advanced EM boot camp. It's a conference. It's, it's not a vacation. Uh, and we promise not to tell if you end up watching part of the conference with, with a marg in hand while you're at poolside. Yes, that is an option. Uh, Martha, did I hear that the dates for the original EM boot camp are also confirmed for December? Is that true? Yes. Yeah, so I'm just going to throw the dates out there. If anybody wants yes. more information, go to our website. So we have the ultrasound workshop. That's December 2nd and 3rd. We also have the main course that follows that, the EM boot camp, the original course is December 4th through 7th. And then we also have our procedures workshop, and that's on December 3rd. And then finally, we have our pharmacology workshop, which is offered also on the 3rd. So, you know, plan accordingly. And that's for Michael Guchner's practitioner, if I'm recalling correctly. He's probably on board for that again this correct. year. Correct. Correct. 
Nice. Well, signups are coming soon. You don't want to get left out in the cold or hot if you're trying for our July camp. Come visit us at the Center for Medical Education website. That's www.ccme.org. That's www.ccme.org. If you get on our socials, we also have an email you can sign up for. Uh, just get, click on a website and you'll put in your email address and you'll get first notification of when signups go live. It's kind of like being on a VIP list, and you're definitely a VIP if you're listening to this. So get on it. All right, Mike, let's move on to segment two. For those of you who feel that you are extremely experienced when it comes to the diagnosis, treatment, management, and identification of tuberculosis, absolutely, fast forward. But I can tell you, once I learned this in school, didn't see it for a while or potentially didn't catch it, uh, well, Hopefully didn't catch it personally also, but <laughs> you forget, right? So I learned so much reading about tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, you know that there are Department of Public Health Specialists. This is their one and only thing, and it's it can be very complicated. So let's get into a short review of TB and the treatments for LTBI and active TB and what to consider in both patients who present to the ER or urgent care with active or needed treatments so here, tuberculosis is caused by, we know, the bacterium called mycobacterium tuberculosis, and the bacteria usually attacks the lungs. But TB bacteria can also attack any part of the body, kidney, spine, brain. And what's interesting about the bacteria is that you can test positive and have absolutely no symptoms. So not everyone infected with TB bacteria becomes sick. You can have primary TB or latent TB, so that's LTBI, or you can have active TB. And that's an active disease or infection. Why do we care about this? Because if you don't treat it or treat it incorrectly, it can be fatal. So let's review some terminology so we don't get confused. Primary TB happens when an otherwise healthy person is in close contact with someone with active TB. And they're coughing and sneezing. The active TB person will spread it to the person who is not sick. And then they will develop active TB from being exposed to the person who is sick. Primary TB patients never had, have never have had LTBI in the past because, note, LTBI patients could have been exposed to DB, TB and not gotten sick at any time. So someone can be exposed to TB, the body fights it, but it remains dormant, so they are exposed. But again, that's the latent TB infection, or LTBI, just because, you know, we're going to use these terms over and over again. You get exposed, you never actually got sick, but you get sick later in life. If you have active TB disease, bacteria is actively multiplying. You are sick and you have symptoms. TB is active in all 50 states and all over the world, and it's spread through the air by coughing, sneezing, speaking, and as the CD CDC likes to say, also by singing. Like, that's what they listed, which I think is kind of funny, um, but I guess a reason not to get a front row at the opera. So, like, is it, does it say that in certain parts of the country it's spread by singing, but not other parts? Is yep. that right? Just just generalized singing. Is generalized. Spread. Okay, so in general, singing can spread this. Okay, I didn't realize, I didn't know if there was like a uh, geographic, like it's okay to, to be exposed to singing TB patients in New York, but not California. Okay, it's not so that specific. Funny. It's funny. I like stuff like that. <laughs> well, active tuberculosis could be primary tuberculosis or reactivation tuberculosis. So let's kind of break those down. Primary TB occurs when the immune system is unable to defend against that mycobacterium tuberculosis infection. Um, and so kind of like they get exposed one time and they get an infection kind of right away. Reactivation tuberculosis, as the name suggests, is the reactivation of contained mycobacterial infection. So in that latent TB infection that Martha was talking about, like you got exposed, you actually did get infected, but it just kind of the body kind of walls it off. And, and keeps it away, you know, kind of like, you know, it lays dormant, so to speak. Reactivation TB is the most common form of active TB, representing 90% of the cases. And this is when that latent infection, gets, you know, comes out and becomes active and is no longer dormant. As we kind of understand, the lung is the most commonly involved organ. We've mentioned GI system, musculoskeletal system to include the spine, the lymphatic system, the reproductive system, many, many systems can be uh, involved with a TB infection. 
when you get tuberculosis, uh, whatever kind of infection you happen to get, the bacteria gets into the lungs and begins to grow. And then if it's not contained, it begins to reproduce and then moves throughout the body. And whether it's in the lungs, the lower respiratory tract, or the throat, the upper respiratory tract, it's very infectious and is easily transmitted to other people. And, uh, you know, you know, both of us work in um, county emergency medicine. And so we have patients who maybe are coming from places where TB is more endemic, and they're living in very kind of like high density housing situations or working in those situations. And so there can be these community outbreaks of tuberculosis. And that's terrifying because mm -hmm. if there are immunocompromised people mixed in there, um, then that can be very quickly fatal for them. Elderly patients, very quickly fatal for them. And, and, and when this is kind of like there's an outbreak and we've lost containment, that's very, very scary. And we can have very rapid spread um, throughout a community. It actually reminds me a lot about like the zombie apocalypse, you know, where everybody has like the zombie latent infection. It doesn't really come out till later. But then, of course, they're dead, so it is a little different. But anyway, moving forward, since we talked earlier about persistent cough or bad cough that lasts three weeks or longer, we want to ask patients also if they have any bloody-colored sputum or phlegm, like actually bloody, you know, be specific. Then, definitely, this could be a sign of tuberculosis. Some other lesser appreciated symptoms are things like weakness and fatigue, weight loss, chills, fever, and night sweats. If you put all those symptoms together, you should be considering TB. Remember, there are about 13 million people in the U.S. with latent TB, and they are not contagious, but persons who have this latent TB infection don't feel sick. Again, we explain that in detail. Um, overall, anybody who has latent TB, it will show up on their PPD. So this is why you get the PPD test and important to identify that. Sometimes you may have to get a chest x-ray or uh, a blood test. There is a serology test for this. I've had that before. And, you know, you just have to make sure you follow this in order to go back to work. You got to get it done every year. Yeah, that's, I had the, my job, requ at least one of my jobs, I forget which one requires that quantifiron goal. They want the blood test. They're not okay with just doing right. the PPD. So, so yeah, you know, your, your practice setting will vary as far as what they require of you, but probably something will be required. Uh, well, by the CDC's estimation, without treatment, about 5 to 10% of infected people with latent TB will develop active TB disease at some point in their lives. About half of them will develop t active TB in the first two years of infection. Um, for people whose immune systems are weak, like let's say with poorly controlled HIV, then the risk of developing active TB is way higher, understandably, than for people with normal immune systems. Yeah, you know, if you go looking for it, you'll find it, I guarantee you, in the next couple of weeks, you're going to find a patient that's positive in some way, shape, or form. If you want to treat it, though, 100% patients are coming in to the ER. They have a positive test. They're not symptomatic. They, they get upset. They're worried. What's super important is you make sure that the patient doesn't have active TB disease because if you treat latent TB, they will... And they and they have an active disease, then you can cause poor outcomes like drug resistance. But we will get back to treating active TB in just a moment. Let's talk a little bit about treating latent TB. The treatment is aggressive and well studied, so hitting up the CDC or hospital guidelines or antibiograms for this is key. Treatment will be different for adults and kids under two years old. Caution all the treatments for latent TB in patients with liver disease because they can get hepatotoxic, Mike, Nailed with the it. use of these TB medications. Although what's interesting is LFTs aren't always indicated. So getting LFTs prior to treatment is recommended for those with a history of liver disease, postpartum patients, or other concerns for liver disease. Honestly, when it's kind of like, should I get it or not get these LFTs, just get the LFTs, you know? It's just kind of middle of the road. Why not? We get LFTs for a lot less, you know? Yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> Treatment for latent TB is not a joke. It can be extremely long, very difficult. Treatment regimens include, I'm going to list these, but I'll also post a link. I just want you to get an idea, really. And this isn't for memorization, an idea of how we treat this. So you could do 12 doses of once weekly. Um, 
Help me pronounce. I-N-H, yeah, isoniazid or I-N-H. I never say isoniazid correctly. I-N-H. I-N-H. That's what we call it, I-N-H, right? Yeah. Or rifampatine. Okay, so that's our first choice, 12 doses of I-N-H or rifampatine. Your other option is four months of daily rifampin. Your other option is three months of daily I-N-H and rifampin. Or lastly, six to nine months of INH, either daily or bi-weekly, depending on what's going on. So you can get the idea here. This is not, you know, let's just treat with a shot of ceftriaxone and doxycycline and be on your way. Like this is legit treatment. The easiest regimen, the shortest is three months, and it just gets longer from there. Yeah. The CDC yeah. and National TB Controllers Association um, suggest that these shorter rifamycin-based regimens are preferred over longer regimens of monotherapy of isoniazid. And that makes sense, right? Like, I think you'd, it makes sense that you'd want to maybe double up on antibiotics. And, you know, someone's going to be more likely to adhere to a shorter course than it's like, well, you got to take, you know, nine months of isoniazid for this to work. Like, well, you know, good luck with that. Um, in the end, you're going to choose the regimen based on drug-drug interactions. This person may already be on some kind of pretty intense, you know, pharmacotherapy already, patient preferences, what's available in terms of, you know, finances and other um, constraints, what resources you have available, any other state and local recommendations, say based on an antibiogram or other resistance patterns, and maybe other variables that may affect adherence to a medication regimen. Um, but in the end, evidence has shown Shorter regimens to help patients finish treatment. I think that's pretty, um, you know, self-explanatory for sure. Yeah. So if you're working to try and figure this out, you know, it can be overwhelming. CDC is a good start. They have some good information. Then the National TB Controllers Association or the American Lung Association are one of my favorites. Uh, the Infectious Disease Society of America. Those are all good places to start. I put a 17-minute video from the Global TB Institute that reviews dosing meds for latent TB and all things you should take into consideration. Also, don't underestimate that value of a chest X-ray. I think that's a good thing. Um, and a lot of these patients, not just with post-infectious cough, but helping with your diagnosis of TB because pulmonary TB will have some findings on the chest X-ray, right? So these are gonna be different uh, for active disease versus past infection. But chest X-ray alone doesn't confirm that the person has active TB disease. There are no actual X-ray features that are a diagnostic preference here for, um, di for diagnosing TB, although they can give us some clues. So let's take a minute now to just talk about uh, the clues for the LTBI, primary TB, and active TB. So people with LTBI, latent TB, typically have normal chest X-rays. X-rays um, aren't really a great screening tool for people. That's why we get the PPD. Primary TB, X-rays can show consolidation in the upper zones with ipsilateral hilar enlargement due to lymphadenopathy. These are typical features of primary TB. The classic location for primary infection is surrounding the lobar fissures, either in the upper part of uh, the lower lobe or in the lower part of the upper lobe. Great pictures online if you want to take a look. Mm -hmm. Healed primary TB. So following this kind of immune response to the infection, we can form a granuloma, and it calcifies over time. And these are known as a gone focus. And it's a primary lesion. It's usually subplural, often in the mid to um, lower zones. And it's named from Anton Gon, an Austrian uh, pathologist. And it's a well-rounded, well-defined focus of this, uh, it's calcified, it's dense, and it's, again, usually located in the periphery of the lung there. So post-primary TB or secondary TB or reactivation TB is more common in immunocompromised individuals like those with HIV AIDS or other um, patients who have immunosuppression. And again, just remember the upper lobes are more commonly affected Definitely get an x-ray on those patients. Consolidations often extend to the hilum. And the hilar structures may be distorted due to the volume loss of that upper lobe. So months later, you may see scarring or fibrosis. And the combined fibrosis and calcification can be described as a, a fibrocalcific change. So you might see that on your x-ray reading. 
We mentioned different screening tests and tests for diagnostics. Um, other tests can be done too, typically not by us, but you know, there's CT scanning and you can maybe find some um, lymphadenopathy easier with doing CT scanning. Maybe they'll see some smaller evidence of consolidation or pleural effusion that we might maybe wouldn't see on a chest radiograph. CT scanning is regarded as the gold standard for imaging of primary pulmonary tuberculosis in kids, even in kids, you know, it's like, well, you know, in kids, we're really very cautious in terms of, you know, loading somebody up with all those rads. But if we're dealing with potential tuberculosis, then, you know, we need to do expose them to the rads to protect them, hopefully from a, a you know, a bad outcome with tuberculosis. MRI is an option too. And I bet that's probably honestly the best way for kids, even though, and even though CT is the gold standard, if we can figure it out with MRI, then that's probably preferable for a child. You, ultrasound can also be used uh, to look at the lungs. CT of the chest can also not just see the lungs. As you know, when you image the chest, you're not looking at the lungs only. You're looking at other things. And so we can be looking at pleura, pericardium, you know, the ribs, chest wall, spine, the liver, the spleen. All those things are seen on a standard chest CT. And so we can see kind of more remote findings of extra pulmonary TB doing some sort of advanced imaging of the chest. Right. So the takeaway here, if you've been a little confused or you already knew this, or if you're like, that's enough, um, I don't want to listen to tuberculosis anymore, or you fast forwarded and you're ready for the takeaways. There are a couple of things in the ER urgent care as clinicians we know um, intimately about, and we're very good at them. If you haven't refreshed your identification skills or treatment of tuberculosis and understanding the difference between the latent infection and active in disease, go ahead and, and rewind and listen again. But remember, TB can be very severe and it can be fatal. So we need to treat that. We need to be cautious about patients who have a prolonged cough or a bloody cough or those other persistent symptoms like we said, fatigue, night sweats, weight loss. Chest x-rays are not always our friend, but can provide helpful information. Definitely take a look at some. Check out patients you know have had any part of the disease and compare those x-rays so you can be better at reading and understanding them. And again, finally, post-infectious cough for multiple weeks. Consider tuberculosis. And that's it. Yeah, there's even other weirder stuff like, uh, you know, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, I think it's called, where people like young patients can have COPD. So, you know, the I, I like to say that the, the body is weirder than we are smart, you know. So much as we know a lot of things about medicine, we've learned a lot of things, there's still weird stuff that happens. And so if someone's not quite fitting into an easy, well-defined box, then like don't be afraid to do more, even if you think like, well – this is probably just a little post-infectious cough, but if just, you know, my, my little rule here is like, I can maybe hand wave away one weird thing, but when I've got to hand wave away two or three or four weird things, then that's not necessarily a one weird thing. That may just be a syndrome of disease. And, and so that's when I say, all right, too many weird things going on. I'm not comfortable just hand waving it away. Let's do some more tests here. And, and, and sometimes I've been rewarded by that. Well, speaking of something rewarding, I was recently asked to be a medical advocate for a family member. They were discharged from a quick hospital stay after catching both influenza A and B. Nice job. Two for two. Uh, they were afebrile at the time when they were discharged. They were rapidly improving, as you do after a couple of days of being down with the flu. And there was no imaging they had that was, you know, strongly suspicious for a bacterial pneumonia, clinically also not suspicious for a bacterial secondary infection. But they were prescribed on the way out the door, levofloxacin. Now, I get it. This person was already hospitalized by the flu, and it's a heck of a thing to beat a virus and then get taken down by a, a bacteria. So sometimes you prescribe antibiotics just in case for higher risk patients, patients who are elderly, immunocompromised, have pre existing heart, lung, et cetera, conditions. So I get that. I have no issues at all with that. But I reviewed their hospital course and their medical history, and there were just really no contraindications to the first line treatments for bacterial pneumonia. So I advocated for them. They prescribed amoxicillin, clavulanate, and doxycycline instead, kind of covering, you know, strep pneumo with amoxicillin, clavulanate, and then doxycycline to hit some of the atypical bacteria. 
bacteria. I know azithromycin is one that we often do for atypicals, but I feel like some recent literature suggests going with doxy over azithro is preferred. And maybe we can get into that on a later podcast. Um, this episode and my opportunity to intervene with my relative really hit home for me a few weeks later when I was perusing my favorite news source. That's mailonline.com, okay? I don't really like Fox News or, or CNN. I like somewhere with, I, I need a little more catty celebrity gossip with my news, and that's what I get from mailonline.com. So I'm reading that, and I see two stories over the past two weeks about the risks of fluoroquinolone prescribing. It really got to me. Mike, you had sent me both of these articles. One was about a 44-year-old woman, woman who had prescribed Cipro for a UTI and after just three pills describes developing neuropathic pain and over the course of three years went from being a fitness enthusiast and working in the healthcare industry to being wheelchair bound on hospice care and requiring a full-time aid. There are before and after pictures, including her account, and they are pretty striking. Another story was it about this American musician, Bobby Caldwell, who passed away at the age of 71 in 2023. He had been prescribed uh, uh, Leviquin, or levofloxacin, after a respiratory infection, and shortly afterward developed Achilles tendon rupture and neuropathy. And his widow described him in intractable pain over the last few years of his life. Maybe you're thinking, all right, folks, enough with story hour, get to the point. Here's my point. If we play the game of medicine long enough, we will take care of patients who suffer direct harm from something we do to them. Our lives will continue, but they may be changed forever. And But for us doing this thing to the patient, they would not have suffered this harm. And when that happens, and it's going to happen, we have to be able to look ourselves in the mirror and say, with the information we had at the time, the circumstances at the time, that this was the only way, or at least it was the best way. A any other action on our part would have likely been a worse action. Humanity is a race of storytellers, and you, if you're new in the practice of emergency medicine and urgent care, you'll eventually have your own stories. But maybe you don't have too many stories about people that have been harmed unnecessarily by antibiotics yet. And I, I, we bring you these stories as a reminder of the human cost beyond what we read in textbooks or hear in podcasts about the potential side effects of fluoroquinone prescribing. And let's get into those right now. First, the Food and Drug Administration has a boxed warning. This is like the new term. It used to be like black box warning, but it's like maybe they just wanted to like just change the terminology here a little bit for whatever reason. So now it's just called boxed warnings. The FDA has a boxed warning about fluoroquinolones. This is considered the highest level warning beyond just a contraindication. I'll read the one for ciprofloxacin now. Warning. Serious adverse reactions include tendinitis, tendon rupture, peripheral neuropathy, central nervous system effects, and exacerbation of myasthenia gravis. Fluoroquinolones, including ciprofloxacin, have been associated with disabling and potentially irreversible serious adverse reactions that have occurred together, including tendinitis and tendon rupture, peripheral neuropathy, central nervous system effects. Discontinue ciprofloxacin immediately and avoid the use of fluoroquinolones in patients who experience any of these serious adverse reactions. Fluoroquinolones, including ciprofloxacin, may exacerbate muscle weakness in patients with myasthenia gravis. Avoid ciprofloxacin in patients with known history of myasthenia gravis. Because fluoroquinolones, including ciprofloxacin, have been associated with serious adverse reactions, and this is a big part here coming up, this is the, the big finish, reserve ciprofloxacin for use in patients who have no alternative treatment options. For the following indications, acute exacerbation of chronic bronchitis, acute uncomplicated cystitis, aka the bladder infection, or acute sinusitis. So that's that's the boxed warning there. Um, and again, you heard it at the very end, the FDA is saying reserve Cipro in those patients who have UT lower UTI, sinusitis, or acute exacerbation of chronic bronchitis, only use Cipro in those patients when there is no alternative treatment option. And, you know, we are, you know, we are responsible for understanding that these black box warnings are out there. Um, you know, you hear things like, ah, tendinitis, neuropathy. Well, you might think, well, how bad could that be? That word alone, those words alone don't necessarily carry the same weight 
as hearing about the stories that Martha was reading off earlier. So sometimes reading it like, oh, like this is actually like pretty bad. The neuropathy is pretty bad. In addition to these effects, fluoroquinolones have also been implicated in aortic syndrome, severe hypoglycemia in the elderly and patients with diabetes, a bunch of things. All that being said, I still prescribe fluoroquinolones, but as a drug of last resort. Even in classic fluoroquinolone situations, prescribing, let's say, Cipro and metronidazole for abdominal infections, I'm seeing folks go away from that, like, decades-long tried-and-true combo, and now they're picking things like ceftriaxone instead of the ciprofloxacin. And this is kind of along the lines of what the FDA is suggesting for these conditions I listed above, reserve fluoroquinolones for use in patients who have no alternative treatment options. For my relative, there were clearly alternative treatment options, and so I really am puzzled, and so was their internal medicine doctor later on when I was kind of, again, continuing my advocacy, and I, I was relating the story about how, like, oh, yeah, they got prescribed Levaquin on the way at the door, and I could, like, hear their voice get concerned, and I was like, but we switched that from Levaquin to something else, and they were like, oh, okay, good, glad you did that. Mm. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, like, the, you know, I, I think that, Fluoroquinolones are still being used in places they don't need to be, and um, we we're, we're rolling other people's dice when we prescribe medicines for them, and we just have to be sure that when we roll those dice for somebody else, that you know we're rolling them w- with the best of intentions, and and there was no other way, there was no clearly better way, and I think with fluoroquinolone prescribing, there are often better ways. Martha, do you have any? particular precautions when you have to prescribe a fluoroquinolone for somebody or if you're considering it? Yeah, you know, I think you really covered a lot of these quite well. Certainly, are there any alternatives? Do I really need it? Did I check with my attending? Like, what's what's their recommendation? Did we decide to maybe consult infectious disease? Like, if it's going down that route, I mean, why not? We have all these consultants. I'm not saying to use them, in the emergency department, we're supposed to make a lot of decisions on our own without our consultants. However, they're there. And if we can't do it on our own, or there's a conflict of interest, or there is a patient exception or something else, you know, just talk to talk to somebody. Get get a second opinion. Remember, um, you know, talking to the patient about their options is certainly something you can also do. Yeah, so let's kind of like brainstorm this a little bit. Like, let's say, like, you know, I, I feel like you and I are kind of blessed in the sense that, like, we have, we could call down a rheumatologist to see a patient in our ED if we wanted to. I feel like we have a lot of the specialties in the House of Medicine that we could bring to bear in person. Um, but, you know, I've, I've worked at jobs and so have you where we didn't have that luxury, you know? And so what's left? Okay, well, we have an antibiogram. That's, that's an option, right? We have probably other antibiotics we can use. Uh, those are options too, but if there's nothing else, you know, I think it's really important that we we kind of talk to patients about, hey, like this is the drug we're going to be putting you on. There are some very serious considerations to be discussed. Um, I, I don't do this lightly. Um, I think that if I don't prescribe this drug to you, I think you're going to get worse in these certain ways. I for sure want you to avi- avoid any sort of explosive movements with your legs, running, jumping, at least while you're taking the antibiotics. And I want you to talk to a primary care practitioner after you're done with the antibiotics, because number one, I want you to follow up on whatever I'm treating you for. That's the first thing, right? And then number two, you guys can talk about, hey, when should I get back to my um, you know, running and jumping now that I've stopped taking the fluoroquinolones? Because there are some studies that suggest it can be months that your risk of tendon rupture is increased after fluoroquinolones. That's a really long tail for for something like this. Um, I know sometimes we'll be treating patients who stepped on a nail, right? They're wearing a shoe, stepped on a nail, and that maybe inoculates their foot. But you know, the, 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 the thing we hear about right from our boards is like, oh, nail through shoe, uh, sole into shoe, that's a risk for pseudomonas. What kills pseudomonas? Well, ciprofloxacin kills pseudomonas, right? But at the same time, it also kills tendons pretty well too. So, uh, you know, I feel like that um, when we have these patients who look like they're not having an active pseudomonas infection in their foot, they just stepped on a nail and they're worried Consider maybe like a more of a uh, course of, let's say, cephalexin 
that'll cover your standard, you know, strep and MSSA, your methicillin susceptible Staph aureus. And then what you do instead of putting them on Cipro, just have them come back in a couple of days. Like you stepped on the nail on Monday, here's some cephalexin. We're going to see you in the ER on Thursday if you're not clearly feeling better. And let's reevaluate and we can do an x ray. Maybe we can see some subcutaneous air. Maybe you're getting worse despite being on the cephalexin for a few days. And maybe then there is no other alternative than putting you on ciprofloxacin. But I think there are ways beyond like, even in those kind of like board review type situations where it's like, oh my gosh, this patient's coming at me from the board review, you know, nail through, you know, dirty su- uh, shoe sole into foot, that's pseudomonas. Well, well, maybe, you know, that's what we think of in the boards, but in real life, how often that happen? I think less than, less than we think. All right, well, Mike. lastly, yeah, it is our oral contrast segment where we get into all the nooks and crannies of a topic, and we're going to talk about incidental findings, Martha. Yeah, let's streamline this a little bit for you all, because there's only a couple things I think we really want you to know, uh, just really those details that matter here. As Mike said, the nooks and crannies, right? So I'm going to talk about three cases of incidental findings seen on imaging or you know, on a blood test for a patient that came to the ER urgent care what to do, the general process, how it relates to your uh, current um, treatments, and how you might want to spruce them up a bit. So first, print out a copy of the finding, whether it's an x-ray, lab result, CT, whatever. Sit down with the patient and tell them their diagnosis and plan for their visit, future visits potentially that could come, and then state the following. Feel free to, to steal. We did some tests today. We found there was nothing wrong with your fill in the blank. But when we do tests, we sometimes find other things that are not related. It doesn't mean that you have another diagnosis or issue that's emergent today. It's something that we call an incidental finding. Incidental findings can be benign. And what that means is they're harmless. But some of these findings need to be followed up and seen by your primary care doctor or sometimes a specialist. They may become problematic in the future, but today they're not causing your problem. You may need a repeat image or a picture or a test. And then sometimes these things reveal themselves over time or with further consultation. But I'm printing this out for you and I want to give it to you. Do you see where I highlighted? Okay, please follow up with your primary doctor. Mike, how do you go about this when you have a generic non-emergency incidental finding. Yeah, this is like an everyday thing for us, I feel like. At least it is for me, you know, like we're always pulling the trigger on, you know, CTs or what have you. And like invariably there's like a liver cyst or a, you know, or a kidney cyst or something, you know. And so, um, yeah, so I, I don't think I have the capability of printing out somebody's imaging finding. Now, why but, do you say that? Do you have Epic? Yeah, but I've, I've tried it. Um, nope, and I've had I've- problems- do you want me to walk you through this? Because you're the third no. clinician I've spoken to. Well, Why? here's here's the workaround, which is kind of, in a way, this might be even better than printing out the finding. Okay, so bear with me. So if I print out the finding and I just give it to them, there's no record necessarily that I gave them that, that piece of paper beyond, like, I said that I gave them a piece of paper. But if I copy and paste the relevant information and I put it in their discharge summary, then that discharge summary is part of the medical record. And it shows like, hey, you know, patient so-and-so, this is a copy of your discharge summary. Can you read this part here? Hey, this is, you know, me, Mike, telling you about this incidental finding. So I I don't say this to say like I am, you know, computer illiterate. I mean, uh, you know. Sorry, I I wasn't... I was trying to start an argument, but you no, shut me down. <laughs> I, no, I, th- I think it's a good argument to be had because, like, mm-hmm. there are some, there's so many ERs out there, right? And there's so many urgent care clinics, and some ERs have policies like we don't print out records for patients. We don't. There's just weird stuff happening out there, which I know would not, you know, fly with you, Martha. But like, some of our listeners kind of like fall into these situations, and so this is it. a way around that in a way. It's like copy paste into discharge summary. Um, that way the patient goes, it goes with them. It's obvious that it was went with them because that discharge summary is part of the medical record. And then you can diagnose them. There is a diagnosis code, ICD-10 code for incidental 
uh, abnormal finding on imaging. And so I put that diagnosis down there too. And then third step is I document our discussion in my in the patient's chart. We discussed abnormal imaging finding and then the plan for follow-up. And the plan for follow-up has to make sense. I can't take somebody who has like financial and housing insecurity and say, hey, please follow up with a pediatric neurosurgeon in a week. Like that's not gonna happen, right? And so I have to make some sort of inroads here. I have to um, more directly connect them to a clinic or at least some sort of you know primary care something. Uh, our hospital has a, a clinic that people without insurance can go to for things like this, for follow-ups on stuff like this. And so there's there's... You do the best you can with the patient's real life in mind, and it has to make sense. Like this is part of, honestly, this is part of like our medical responsibilities. You can't just give somebody a plan that does not jive with with their lives. And so yeah, totally um, agree. just make sure that when you do give them that plan for follow-up, it has to make sense. All right. I like your workaround. A couple of other things that are important. Do not guess what an incidental finding may mean if you don't know. Let's talk about some easier cases versus some more difficult cases. Let's talk about an otherwise healthy female who came to the ER for nausea, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. You work her up. She feels better. She gets labs and a CT done. You were trying to rule out an appendicitis, but her CT was clear. Okay, that's a short story. But you find an incidental renal cyst, and you want to discharge the patient. What do you do? Okay, yeah, so this is, again, a common situation here. You can use any of the phrases we used above, and you can explain the diagnosis, which for them would be, hey, it's abdominal pain, it's nausea, it's diarrhea. Sometimes the symptoms are the uh, the discharge diagnosis. And then you say, yeah, we found a renal cyst on your CT, um, but you know, my, my usual phrasing here is, there was nothing else to include the renal cyst that requires further evaluation or treatment in the emergency department right now, the renal cyst is not causing your diarrhea or your abdominal pain, but it needs to be followed up on. I don't want you to, and then you fill in the blank with whatever seems to make sense in terms of their follow-up plan. It might be to a free clinic. It might be to their established primary care practitioner. It, it, it may be whatever, but you know, make it clear what their plan is for follow-up. And then I personally like to document that the patient agreed with the plan. Um, your clinic or your ED usually has some sort of a list of primary care practitioners to include people like, you know, a federally qualified health center for patients who don't have medical insurance. They can go there with, and, and pay little to no money at all and be seen for primary care. Now, there are some situations in which an you know, incidental finding may be more emergent, like maybe we're worried about neoplasm or the possibility of neoplasm. And so in those situations, maybe you are giving them directly a referral with a name attached to it. You're going to see Jim Smith, you're going to see Doc Brown, and and they're the ones that you're going to, uh, you know, see. And maybe you even call Jim Smith or Doc Brown and you say, I have this patient, I really want you to bring them in next week because of fill in the blank, whatever imaging finding that you found. Yep, absolutely. All right. So I was going to talk a little bit about what a renal cyst actually means, but that could be a little homework for you because what I really wanted you to do was experience the American College of Radiology uh, to basically look up incidental findings. So if you put in on their website, renal cyst, it talks about everything that they think Think about, consider, and algorithms for the approach to these things, whether it's a cyst or it's later identified as a mass, and how they work that up, how they treat it. So, you know, if you have no idea what a renal cyst, you know, is going to mean for a patient, but then you read this literature and you're like, oh, if the patient starts crying, you could be like, hey, hey, listen, like, I know a little bit about these. I'm, I'm not, you know... Uh, a urologist or a nephrologist or anybody that specializes in renal cysts. But what I can tell you is that there's some interesting literature about there about treatments. And sometimes most of them we don't do anything about, but I do want you to follow up. So I think just having a little bit of extra knowledge is, is important. But again, if you don't know anything about it, don't pretend like you do. Um, that brings me to uh, having empathy 
for patients, not just sympathy. So of course, if you've had a renal cyst and it was diagnosed and you had the big workup and treatment for it, you could share that if you wanted to. But um, I kind of think about this when I see a patient with a keloid. Okay, so moving on to our next case about a skin issue, I'm like, oh, I see you have a keloid. How long has it been there for? You know, I've had some serious issues with multiple keloids, and they might tell me, oh, I've had no treatment, or I've tried this, and I sort of empathize with them about that. I say, oh, have you seen this dermatologist because they helped me, or, oh, I tried that treatment, wasn't so successful, right? So that's okay once in a while if you have the time. Again, it's off the record. It's fine. I think as you get more confident in your care and and conversating with patients, it's okay. Um, You don't need to have super duper buffed up filler conversation. Um, But this brings me to emergent skin diseases and people that come to the emergency department. I actually really love diagnosing non-emergent skin diseases. If I'm looking around the body, I'm like, oh, you know, here's a skin tag or here's a keloid or oh, look at that scar. I bet that dates back to 1995 based on the way the Langer lines have healed. So, you know, there's lots of things like that. Let's talk about this next case, which is about a skin lesion. It's a case by Dr. Stephen Schleicher, and he uh, wrote for Clinical Advisor. By the way, I like this online site because doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, they all write for the site, and sometimes even admin people in healthcare. So I think it's really cool, a lot of perspectives. It's part of what's called the Haymarket Medical Network, I have no affiliation with them, honestly, but some people are like, okay, like, how do I find this if I don't specifically want emergency medicine? I want maybe their app or their print or their live event or something. It's this Haymarket Medical Group. So um, really, uh, free plug for them. Wish I was getting a kickback, but I'm not. So Mike, why don't you tell everybody about this case of a 20-year-old woman? Yeah, this lady was requesting evaluation of a mole on the side of her left foot. The uh, mole, or whatever it is, has been there for several years and remained unchanged, but uh, as people often do, they they read a little something about melanoma, whether it's an article or someone says like, hey, my friend or my relative had this melanoma, maybe you worry about that. This patient's personal and family history, thankfully, were negative for skin cancer, but she did have frequent sunburns as a child, which we know is a risk factor for, you know, skin cancer later on, as well as the occasional use of indoor tanning beds. And the exam reveals this irregularly shaped hyperpigmented macule, so a flat lesion there. And then they did see little scattered other nevi appearing lesions elsewhere on the body. So the website immediately asks you to answer a question, which I like because it's interactive. They immediately say, based on this information, what is the most likely diagnosis? It is an acral melanocytic nevus, or AMN, which, by the way, I knew nothing about. Is it a superficial spreading melanoma? Is it an ink spot? Or is it, Mike, help me with this one. Yeah, lentigo maligna. Yeah, so I didn't know much about that one either. And this is why I'm really into these non-emergent skin issues, because I'm like, wow, there's so many things I don't know. So derm, again, wasn't my favorite topic, but now that I've read more about it and sort of heard these interesting stories, I think it's really cool to learn something more about. So if you if you hate something and, and derm is it, I suggest little quizzes and websites and things like this to help you succeed. You're, you're leaving out. What, what did you guess? I mean, it asked you to guess. Okay. So I, of course, I guessed wrong. I went to the worst case scenario. Well, that's, that's kind of what we do in emergency medicine. So we <laughs> think we're the worst case scenario. That's appropriate, I suppose. <laughs> So I actually guessed uh, melanoma, but that's not it. It was actually this AMN, which is the acral melanocytic nevus. And then 17% of people also guessed melanoma, so I wasn't alone, which made me feel not that dumb. But let's talk a little bit about AMN. Right, uh, AMN or acral melanocytic nevi are benign, so non-cancerous pigmented lesions commonly found on the volar surfaces of the palms and soles. So volar, like the palm side of the arm or the sole side of the foot versus the dorsum, as well as sometimes it's within the nail unit. You hear these kind of crazy stories of people having skin cancer in their nails. Well, these AMN can be also inside of the nail unit too. 
Prevalence in the U.S. is pretty high, between 23 to 42%. So like 1 in 4, 4 in 10, higher rates observed in Asian populations. Most commonly, these are seen in females under the age of 50 with darker skin pigmentation. These are usually smaller than 6 millimeters or 0.6 centimeters. And these are usually macules, so again, flat lesions. And how do you know between a macule and a papule? You close your eyes and you run your finger over it. And if you don't feel a bump, well, that's a macule, if you can't tell. Um, so macules with light brown to black coloration. And you know there can be different kinds of gene mutations that these AMNs, these nevi, can be linked to. But in the end, regardless whether it's from a gene mutation or not, this is still a benign lesion. Yeah, so Dr. Schleicher goes in to further explanation. He talks about uh, basically getting a really great magnifying glass to look at this. And then it will reveal a classic linear pigmentation along the sulci of the skin markings and basically have a parallel furrow pattern. So yeah, get yourself a nice little handheld uh, item from one of your favorite online buying sites that will help you magnify skin lesions. I won't tell you which one I like to use the most, but you know, this is something I wasn't interested in and now I am. So Mike, what do you think? Yeah. So, I mean, I remember back in PA school, like, especially my derm instructor being like, you're going to want you to get yourself a, a dermoscope or a dermatoscope, you know? And it's like, all right, I'm not going into derm, but like, maybe I'll consider it, you know? But yeah. So like there are these, you know, devices called dermoscopes or dermatoscopes. And, you know, if you find yourself looking at a lot of skin lesions, if you say that your practice involves it a lot, then maybe you consider getting that sort of thing. All right. Well, so Finishing up here, I think it's important to take a look at everybody's issue. And you can kind of say, hey, you know, I know this isn't emergent, but at least address it to the patient. If you want to get better at some of these cases, go online, look at them, check out Clinical Advisor, check out our CCME website, check out MRAP, you know, follow some of these cases and see what happens. Um, I wanted to just have Mike talk about a final case on an incidental finding and tell us about that, Mike. Right. So my two cases, uh, you know, one was my dad and my dad, you know, in his older age had kind of some of the things that people who are aged get as far as high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, which led to, of course, to some heart stuff. But he started having some shortness of breath and some pulmonary symptoms later on in life. And it was kind of chalked up to his, uh, you know, heart, even though his heart was checking out okay. He still kept on having these pulmonary symptoms. And so one day he went to the ED for abdominal pain. And as you do with anybody over 65 with abdominal pain, you get a CT scan. You don't even think twice. And some folks even say, hey, down to 60 years old, go ahead and get that CT scan. And sure enough, they found these lesions in the abdomen and in the chest cavity which had nothing to do, as far as we could tell, with abdominal pain, but those led to a diagnosis of mesothelioma in him. And so it had nothing to do with the abdominal pain, as far as I could tell, but but that led to the diagnosis of his, of his cancer. And then uh, my mom. So my mom, uh, in later on in life, she finally got appendicitis in like her 70s. And they did the CT scan to find that because, again, if you're over 60 and you have abdominal pain, you go in the donor of the truth and you look for what's going on here. And they found the appendicitis and, of course, did the surgery to fix that. But they said, hey, you also have this weird kind of lesion in your colon. And that's how we figured out that she had colon cancer. And, um, you know, thankfully she beat that, you know. So, uh, yeah, she's no slouch. She definitely took care of that stage four colon cancer with Mets, no problem, um, which is kind of like bonkers to like just say out loud. Um, so, yeah, both of those cancers in my parents were incidental findings. And, again, you, you play this game long enough, um, you're going you're gonna to diagnose weird things when you weren't even looking for them, sadly enough. Mm -hmm. Um Bizarre side thing that I kind of just looked up one day. There was this study, a population-based study uh, somewhere out of Europe, I want to say France, that said that acute appendicitis seemed to be a warning sign for colon cancer in middle-aged and younger adults. The risk of presenting with cancer of the colon was higher during the first six months after acute appendicitis 
patients treated for appendicitis presented in this study a, is a population-based study, again, so it's not like, you know, prospective or whatever else, but still, four times higher risk of being diagnosed with colon cancer than the control group during the first year of follow-up, and the confidence interval goes between 3.5 to 6, so it's still pretty, like, solid, and eight times higher during the first six months, so even higher during the first six months, while the risk of diagnosis of colon cancer was also significant for patients over 40 years, it was even greater in patients under 40 years who had between a 6 and 12 fold increased risk of colon cancer. So like, you have to consider like, well, what does that mean? What's the what's the control group risk of colon cancer? It may be relatively low in the undifferentiated patient, but still 6 or 12 times that um, is pretty significant. So interesting hmm. kind of uh correlate there. And we'll definitely have that study and everything else we talked about today on our website. That is twoview.fireside.fm. That's the number twoview.fireside.fm. Hmm. Sorry to hear about all that, Mike. Ed, but, you know, again, kind of tying everything together, incidental findings can really change the course of a patient's life big time. Yeah. Well, we right. have our two view trivia questions and answers right now. Is that what we're we're going for now? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and I will. How about this? Do you want to give the question and answer, and then I'll do the 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 new question and answer? How does that go? Sure. That's so, fine. Okay, let's do that. Last month's question was. What is the full name of the doctor who first described Jones fractures, and what country did he reside in? And the answer was, it was first described by Sir Robert Jones, 1857 to 1933, a Welsh orthopedic surgeon. And he first described this in 1902, so really at the beginning of the 1900s, Jones was also an early advocate of the potential usefulness of x-rays in medical practice. Well, our winner this month is Tori Chibatar. Tori is a new nurse practitioner, and she's super interested in learning more about practicing emergency medicine for fun and profit. Uh, my choice of words, not hers. Tori, congratulations. You're going to get, I believe it's 20% off an online uh, course from ccme.org. That's correct? Is that the gift we're giving away right now? That is correct. Okay, very good. Well, um, we have our new question coming up here, and it's this. It's a two-part question, so you've got to give us two answer choices, and it's this. Dermatoscopy, or dermoscopy, is a relatively new way of examining things. Who first coined the term dermoscopy? And name one organization that has named an award in their honor. And you'll need to email us your two-part answer in addition to anyone you want to give a shout out to, any sort of feedback or comments about the episode, uh, to twoviewcast at gmail.com. That's our email address, twoviewcast at gmail.com, the number twoviewcast at gmail.com. Well, that is our episode. More information on the original and advanced emergency medicine boot camps. The Center for uh, Medical Education website is the place for that. That's www.ccme.org. Thanks for listening and attending this episode of The Two View. You can subscribe and rate us on Apple iTunes Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube Music. Uh, RIP Google Podcasts. It's going away soon. Search for Two View Emergency. That's the number Two View Emergency, and it will come right up. Ratings help us climb the chart so that other clinicians get some two view goodness like you are doing right now. If you like YouTube and you want to see Martha's dog in the background, what's your dog's name, Martha? Oh, which one is that? Oh, that's Finley. He's 15. Okay, Finley. He's been, on, he's been on the show before. Well, check out Finley regardless. If you haven't seen Finley recently, you haven't seen Finley, okay? So if you like that, if you want to see us on the video, check for Center for Medical Education uh, on the YouTube, and you can attach the video version of our podcast. Don't forget our website where you can go next level on any of our topics from any of our episodes, including all the papers and sites we refer to. That's twoview.fireside.fm. Our audio and video engineers are Ricky Bucata and Dave Pett. Show notes are by Meg Dipple. Thanks for tuning in, friends and EM. Share this post. Wow, Mike, I ruined it.
You got this. <laughs> Share. Hey, you know what? I'm going to change. I'm changing our ending. I am because social media is such a thing. So I'm fixing this. I'm fluffing it up today. Thank you again for tuning in, friends and EM. Share by posting our podcast on your social media site. Share the podcast with a friend in conversation and share your thoughts via email. And thanks again for sharing your time with us today on The Two View. Have a good day and a great shift. Bye, Finley. Good dog. Bye-bye.